Hello, this is Matthew and welcome to Rock Paper Shotgun. And that's a much friendlier welcome than you're going to get from Blasphemous. Here the penitent one wakes up on a pile of dead lookalikes, and the first friend you make just wants to crack your skull with a candlestick. Oh, watch out mate, you're getting penitent ones all over the place. Don't worry though, you're just as much a freak as anything you murder. No sooner has the Warden of the Silent Sorrow given you a good whacking, but you are filling your pointy hat with his blood and plunging your head into it. I'm pretty sure Gwyneth Paltrow's health blog said this was good for exfoliating. We'll all be doing it soon. The point is, from its very first seconds, Blasphemous is full on stuff a 100% commitment to being a bit much. Every enemy you meet explodes with 16-bit gore. There are execution animations that must have deeply scarred whoever prodded those pixels for weeks on end. There's this lady full of swords who gives you health upgrades and a big metal head that says things like May the gold in my visage melt and erase the contrition of your soul. Even the item flavour text has to be chewed over. It's flavour text with actual flavour, that of gamey meat, rich and dark. With the right clips, indeed the clips used in the eye-catching early trailer, Blasphemous could seem heavy-handed. It's Castlevania redrawn by someone who just discovered Francisco Goya's edgelord years. But while the sight of a man being torn in half by a baby yes may draw in the punters looking for shock and gore, there is a lot more to Blasphemous than that, which is why I put together this little video review. For my sins, I do have to ask you to like and subscribe to Rock Paper Shotgun, but trust me, I will be flagellating myself for wasting the time of any existing subscribers. Now, onwards! Blasphemous is a 2D platforming action-adventure, or a Metroidvania. That's the genre that holds anything and everything that is a bit like Metroid or Castlevania. Do you remember when some people tried to get the rival term Castleroids off the ground? I do, because a friend gave it to me as a nickname, my surname is Castle, and I think lots of people thought I had hemorrhoids. I did not. Anyway, I digress. Now, while Blasphemous shares visual DNA with Castlevania, you start on village outskirts and work towards a towering cathedral of pain, it feels more like Metroid. There's much less emphasis on RPG character development, you don't level up outside of a few stages of sword proficiency, and health and magic upgrades have to be found in hidden rooms. There are buffs in the form of rosary beads, but they're mostly there to take the edge off specific boss fights, before you swap them for the trinket that pays you for kicking the shit out of candlesticks. I'm going to be rich, rich, rich! Fundamentally, the Penitent One is a hero driven by fixed collectibles, rather than random loot and XP, which is really all the excuse I need to tap every wall and ground pound every crack looking for hidden rooms. If, like me, you're a massive sucker for gradually ticking a save file completion rate towards 100, there's a good 15 or so hours of this to keep you busy. Where it differs from the Metroidvania genre is in the lack of gear gating. That's the design idea where you hit an obstacle, say, a room full of impassable bloodthirsty cats. Then you go and find a new ability elsewhere, like this colourful ball. And then you use that new gear to get past the gate. This would have worked better if the cats had run after the ball. Never work with kids or animals, folks. But Blasphemous doesn't do gear gating. Everything you need to reach the end is with you from the start. A sword, a jump, and a sliding dodge. What new powers you can earn, called relics, exist more to uncover secrets hidden throughout the world. Earning the ability to see bloodied steps or grow new root platforms is more about the backtracking. That's returning to previous errors to mine them for collectible body parts or tiny cherubs encased in glass. Though, looking at what the cherubs might grow into, I'm not sure freeing them is a smart idea. Stripping it back to simple moves achieves a couple of nice things. Firstly, you can approach the map as you want. 
Okay, the second half of the game is gated off until you beat three bosses in the first half, but those monstrous freaks can be tackled as you see fit. There's never any confusion about where to go next, because everywhere is fair game, simply limited by your technical ability or, more likely, patience. I wish I'd known this from the outset as I bounced off these windswept cliffs for some time thinking this is a bit steep, both literally and figuratively, before realising that I could tackle the gentler bell ringing puzzles of Jondo first. Don't get me wrong, I love the sense of a map slowly blooming out as my powers accumulate, but the freedom in Blasphemous does make you realise how often Metroidvania designers call it exploration, but actually ask you to excavate one hit hidden path through their maze. There's none of that here. The second benefit is the simple nostalgia rush of trying to squeeze such a basic hero through the hell gauntlet the Game Factory have built. Blasphemous is as much a platformer as it is an action game, with entire rooms dedicated to leaping challenges to reach a collectible, or long stretches that mix up combat with unusual physical obstacles. As I jumped over swinging blades or timed slides under an army of phantom librarians, I was whisked back to even earlier Castlevanias than the Metroid Symphony of the Night. It's not just the pixels that bring to mind 16-bit adventures, but the world that's been built with them. Taken in isolation, some of these rooms could be torn from Super Castlevania 4, almost as if they took the stages of that game and stitched them into the free-flowing castle that would come to define the later series. It may not have the corny Mode 7 magic of the SNES's cylindrical rooms, but it does have a chamber with a giant freaking bell that splats anything dumb enough to leap in its path. As John Donne once famously wrote, never send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for this guy's face. And that to me is pure video games. And the bell isn't a standalone bit of slapstick. At one point I had sword fights with a gallery of magical paintings. This is a silly game. For all its Catholic iconography and references to Spanish folk traditions, that pointy hat is a nod to these chaps apparently, Blasphemous ends up being way more playful than it first appears. There's a library full of floating heads with Elizabethan ruffs, and bishops in magical floating chairs who poke at you in the same way that I go to work on sausages with cocktail sticks. And listen to the sound it makes when this big bellboy whacks into you. Oh, that is the good stuff! And that playfulness bleeds into every region of the map, giving it a twist or taste of its own. Having to use the wind to blow yourself across impossible gaps in the mountains is very different to manipulating levers to arrange light ladder puzzles in the library, or navigating a maze of jail cells filled with rampaging prisoners. Sometimes it might just be the appearance of swinging bells or irritating alchemists, eat that you shit, but it creates a world of different rhythms and a proper sense of progress. As much as I loved the very similar Bloodstained earlier in the year, it did over rely on endless corridors full of monsters. There's a little bit more going on in Blasphemous. And another thing, the bosses are surprisingly great. I mean, they make me want to puke, but what else was going to happen when you pour custard on an open brain wound? I think bosses brilliantly illustrate the tension between Blasphemous's grim sales pitch and its more enjoyable nature. On paper, these things are pure nightmare fuel, gnarled atrocities that crawled out of a Guillermo del Toro sketchbook, but somehow found a massive health bar on the way. There's the infamous baby and his evil snake pal, for starters, but I was also profoundly disturbed by the skeletal archbishop carried on a sea of hands that you have to chop away to stick a sword in his clattering teeth. I will never look at crowd surfing the same way again. If their grand names evoke the horrors of Dark Souls, these are far from the sticking points that those bosses were. They are very old-fashioned in their adherence to attack patterns and the clear flagging of moves. 
lives, to the point that many feel like nimble dexterity puzzles, with occasional stabbings to, you know, move on to the next bit. I know this sounds like Boss Design 101 and probably isn't news to anyone, but it's very easy to get this stuff wrong. Normally I meet a boss and I feel my spirit drop, but I didn't have any of that here. It took me a few fights to learn the tells, and then it was just down to my thumbs to keep up. I still end these fights with my virtual heart weak and my real heart thumping in my chest, but they felt doable and fair without being neutered. And if they do lack spice, well there's always the achievement for beating them without health flasks. That should keep you busy. I mentioned Dark Souls there, and it's a comparison I've seen a bit around Blasphemous, but I'm not sure it sticks. The similarities are mostly the similarities that Soulsborne games share with Metroidvanias. Finishing a boss and finding a shortcut back to an early area was not invented by Demon Souls after all. There is no stamina bar, and while you do have a Soulsy block and parry, it is limited to certain melee attackers, and the timing is so generous that it's basically an instant kill button for certain enemies, although I love the execution animations. If you stun enemies with a perfect counter, you wouldn't see that on a frickin' SNES. I guess there's a bit of Dark Souls in the game's more ambiguous moments. There are lots of items that don't explain their purpose that you'll have to decipher, and the plot has to be stitched together from chunks of lore attached to everything you find. But even then, the game is far more overt in what it's saying, although I would be interested to hear a theologian explain some of the more outlandish imagery. The mechanic that feels the most soulsy is the punishment upon death. Instead of losing your currency, dying adds guilt to your character, which limits the length of his further bar. It's a nice enough idea, but I wish it wasn't tied to what is basically your magic bar. Fact is, your spells are probably the least interesting part of the game. They take ages to activate and are mostly pretty weak, meaning you'll often forget about them which means you can forget about the whole guilt thing too. In a similar way, there's a mechanic that lets you hurt yourself to earn further, nicely tying into the self-flagellating penance practiced by many of the suffering souls in this world. But again, there's no reason to engage with it when further is so underpowered. Focus instead on currency and buying powers at the Mere Culpa Shrines, and you'll be more than prepared for anything the game throws at you. Something so easily ignored can't spoil the game, but it is annoying to see time wasted on a flimsy idea, especially when the concept of guilt has such significance to the story itself. It's just a shame it can't play a more mechanically significant role in your quest. But when your biggest complaint is with something it didn't do, you're usually onto a winner. Like so many retro throwbacks, this feels like 16-bit gaming as it was, but it really wasn't like this. By taking the very simple action of that era, but marrying it to the more ambitious structure of the modern Metroidvania, I think Blasphemous genuinely finds a style all of its own, and stands out in a genre which is not short of gems. Less Dark Soulsy than Hollow Knight, more classic Castlevania than Bloodstained, it's a real surprise, and a lot more fun than the oppressive setup might have you think. At this point, Blasphemous has been out for a few days, so I'd been keen to hear your thoughts if you've played it, and how many times that baby tore you in half. And if you enjoyed this little video, maybe watch our other reviews. I recently took a look at Gears 5 and Control, and have thoughts to share on those. Oh, and I would really appreciate the like and subscribe. Oh no, that's twice I've said it now. Better get started on the flagellating. Bye for now.